several times when the Buddha was especially critical of the teachings of other teachers of his time. And the teachings that he criticized most heavily, things like fatalism, materialism, agnosticism. And the terms he used to criticize them were pretty simple. So these teachings give you no sense of what should and shouldn't be done. And as a result, they offer no protection. It's interesting to think about these comments, because they tell us, on the one hand, what the Buddha's ideas of a good teaching were, and also what we should look for in his teachings. Clear ideas of what should be done, what shouldn't be done. And it's interesting that he says that's the sort of thing that gives you protection. What does it protect you from? Well, on the outside it protects you from the teachings of people who say there really aren't any shoulds or shouldn'ts, you're totally free to do whatever you want. Or people who had really weird ideas about what should and should not be done. And they also protect us from ourselves, because we have lots of di desires that go in lots of different directions. And so it's helpful to have some wise advice on how you sort out through your desires to figure out which ones are worth following and which ones are not. Because after all, desire is a part of the path, and a craving is the cause of suffering. So you have to learn how to distinguish what kind of desires are good and which ones are bad. Craving for sensuality, the Buddha said, is going to make you suffer. Craving to become this, become that. Or once you become something, craving to have that become destroyed. Those things are going to make you suffer. The kind of desires that are good for you are the ones where you focus on trying to develop skillful qualities, or if they're not there, to give rise to them, and when they're there, to develop them. Try to abandon unskillful qualities, and once you've abandoned them, try to keep them from coming up again. Those kind of desires, desires are worth fostering. That's what the Buddha says in the Four Noble Truths. The thing about the Four Noble Truths is they're truths in two, at least two different senses of the word. One is their true statements about things, and in the other sense are the actual facts themselves. And the description of craving is one thing, and the actual experience of craving is something else. But and the description points the actual experience. When the Buddha is talking about the truths being noble, it's not that craving is noble or suffering is noble, but the truth about them is noble. The statement about them is noble. Statements about them are noble. In the sense that the true across the board, the one place where the Buddha talks about the noble truths in a way where you see the distinction of what he means by noble is where he contrasts them with individual truths, the truths that are true only for some people, are true for people with a limited range of knowledge. Those he calls individual truths. And then there are noble truths, and truths that are true for everybody. And they carry the same tasks for everybody. And when he talks about the tasks, now that's he's talk where he's talking about the actual experience. In other words, you don't abandon the teaching about craving, but you try to abandon the craving itself. You don't develop the teaching about the path, you actually develop the path itself, the qualities that the, the statements about the path are actually pointing to. So the truths function both as statements and as actualities. And the statements have their worth. These are the things that are noble because they're true for everybody. And they point us in the right direction. They give us some idea of what should and shouldn't be done, because, as I said, each of the truths, as a fact, has a duty. You try to comprehend suffering, abandon the cause. So you can realize the cessation of suffering, and you do this by developing the path. 
So each truth has its has its duty. And it's in the course of following these duties that you learn even more about what should and shouldn't be done. Because after all, the Buddha can't point out everything in the world. He gives you some general ideas about which actions are skillful and which ones are not. Big, broad categories. It's only when you get down to actually following the duties for each of the Four Noble Truths that you begin to realize that there are subtleties that you can learn to observe for yourself. Because this is where a third level of the truth comes in, and that's the truth of your practice. The sincerity with which you really do try to develop the path, and which you use the Four Noble Truths as a guide. Because one of the things they say is that you're going to have to abandon a lot of the things that you identify with, the things that you really like, the desires around which you create your sense of who you are. And it takes something special in order to be able to abandon those things, where you make the Four Noble Truths more important than yourself, or your sense of yourself. There will be times when the mind says, I want X. And if you look at the Four Noble Truths, they say, no, you don't. You, you may want X, but it's not good for you. It's not going to help put an end to suffering. And it's not going to lead you to a happiness that's harmless. Because you have to keep in mind that your desires have an impact not only on you, but on people around you. Your search for happiness. has an impact on people around you as well. I've told you about that time I wrote a review about a book on positive psychology. I was asked to look at the book and critique it from a Buddhist point of view. And the thing I noticed was that the book had nothing about how your actions or how your ideas about pursuing happiness were going to have an impact on other people. It was all about how much happiness we're actually going to get for you, but there was no consideration of what it's going to do down the line in terms of karmic consequences, in terms of how it's going to have an impact on the people around you. The author was actually trying to be, quote, objective, unquote, and saying, well, we have to study how thieves make themselves happy, so we can't judge the morality of their actions. And so I pointed out that from the Buddhist point of view, this doesn't work at all. Because that attitude, of course, doesn't give you protection. If your happiness or your pursuit of happiness doesn't take into consideration how it's going to affect other people, then it's very short-sighted. I submitted the article, and the editors of the magazine were surprised that I had chosen to speak about karma in this context. Of course, I was surprised that they were surprised. This is what the Buddha is having you think about all the time. Your actions have consequences. And so you have to think about okay, this happiness that you want by pursuing this particular desire, no matter how much you may identify with it as your desire or what you want. If you give that preference over the, the desire to find a truly harmless happiness, then you're not really sincere in the path. So this is a third level in which the truths are true. They're statements, they're facts, but they're also qualities of the heart. They demand certain qualities of the heart, a certain nobility, a certain truthfulness. This is where the truths are especially noble and especially true. And at the same time, when you develop these qualities, these are the things that give you real protection. Because in the process of having developed your sensitivity to what's really skillful, you've heightened your powers of observation. You heighten your sensitivity to the effects of your actions. For example, as we're practicing concentration here, the basic desire to get the mind to settle down is a good desire. It's part of right effort. But as we all know, 
the desire on its own is not going to be enough. And there are times when that desire is too strong, and sometimes where it's too weak, where it's not focused properly. There's a lot more to desire than just saying, I have good intentions. If you want the desire to be skillful, you have to be able to adjust it so that it's, as the Buddha said, it's not excessive, it's not too sluggish. Adjust it so that it's focused on the causes rather than on the effects. And as you sort out all the different issues around the desire or the desires that are involved in getting the mind to settle down, you learn a lot. You become a more reliable observer. And you're in a better position to give yourself protection. So we have the truths as outside guides to help strengthen our skillful desires, to help protect us against our unskillful ones. But it's only through following the tasks appropriate to the truths that we become protectors for ourselves. That statement the Buddha had, the self is its own protector. This is where you realize the extent to which that can be true. And that's when you realize how true the truths are, and how noble in both senses of the word. Noble in the sense that they are universal, and noble in the sense that they really do demand a nobility of character to make them special. <laughs>